Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I am Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And who are you? I'm Ken Hamilton. (laughs) Yeah. We are talking with you during the beginning of season two. This is episode two, season two. We're talking about, well, more ethical non-monogamy stuff. So we We couldn't fit everything in last one episode, one (laughs) half hour episode. So we're going to talk a little more about it. I believe that if we were to total up the number of hours we have spent talking about this over the last decade or so. Wow. What do you think? Oh, God. Well, definitely in the thousands of hours. I mean, we're into a good... How many uh, hours are in a decade? I don't know. Well, so a working year is 2,080 hours. So it's a good solid two full-time job years. (laughs) Definitely. At at the very least. We talk about this a lot with each other, which is one of the reasons why it's not so terrifying to talk about it in a public format. Um, But it still has its edge. It does. I've embarrassed myself several times in private. Now I can do it in public. It's fine. (laughs) I don't think you're as embarrassing as you think you are. Well, the embarrass- although you're easily embarrassed. Well, I am easily embarrassed, but the embarrassment comes about when I talk about things that I don't actually know about. That's the embarrassment. I mean, I'm not embarrassed to talk about the topics of non-monogamy. Well, as I just- do in our private life, I will invite you to return to I statements and just talk yes. about your your there perspective. So, and that's actually what we're going to do today. We're going to talk yeah. about intimacy. Um, as it's connected to our experience of polyamory. And we're going to talk about what it feels like for us to to be in this relationship that doesn't rely on the the picture that we were both painted yeah. that was painted for us when mm-hmm. we were growing up it it sits outside of that. so we have we had to first imagine it into being and then figure out what works for us and what doesn't. And the very first thing that comes up for me when I think of the word intimate is a conversation I had in a, in a classroom um, several years ago when I just posed the question, do you mind if you're, um, if you're, it was a group full of people, it was mostly young men, um, college classroom. I said, do you mind if your girlfriend goes on an intimate dinner with her friend? And one of the dudes got really upset. He was like, no, no, you just ruined it. I don't even want to hear that sentence. I don't even want you to say that sentence out loud. He was very, very worked up. Um, lots of affect. And it really was. It was the word intimate. It was the word intimate. It connected to his girlfriend with anyone else. I hadn't specified anything about what that meant. Um, but it, it lit him up from the inside. And the conversation carried on. It actually resolved really well. It was fine. It was a great jumping off point. But yeah, talk about trigger. It it was all wrapped into that word intimate was a lot of expectation and a lot of fear, a lot of panic. And I I remember that I see the look on this, this young man's face and think, right, a lot of us were given one script most of us probably we were given one script for how romantic love was going to work and for how adult relationships works which means it has to include a romantic even though you might be aromantic or asexual you may not experience it the same way everybody else does but there's this one painting and we're all supposed to look at this this painting or this one menu or this one picture whatever however you want to imagine it and what i think that and what i think is interesting about that is yep so okay here's your menu Okay. It says intimacy. Okay. Um, What is that? What is intimacy? And clearly there were things connected to it for him that... um, well, that aren't that, that, for you. That aren't for, for me. For instance. Or at least, you know, the, the, the activation that he had, the, the, yeah. the emotional turmoil 
that it that's exactly yeah it brought him to a spot um, of turmoil and so so i don't even i mean i i don't know i wasn't there i don't know the people involved but i wouldn't know it for most people what what is intimacy so we thought we'd talk about so if you know, how where how we approach the concept of it. So if I say I'm going to have an intimate dinner with someone, what happens for you? What's your reaction? So um well honestly, I if you just said you're going to have dinner with someone, I think that um Well first you feel like you'll miss out on some yummy food. Food though. <laughs> Um, so the intimate dinner for me, and so here we are, we're talking about ethical, ethical non-monogamy and we're talking about scripts and I immediately picture two people, yeah. which is silly because you can be intimate for as many you people, everyone, um, can be as intimate with as many people as we each you've have, defined. So we each have a different capacity perhaps for mm -hmm. how we can, um, spend our our attention there is something about undivided attention there is definitely that something about that i do feel holds true even when you're talking about people like us who um have experienced not only um other romantic relationships other intimate connections but also um intimate connections where there are three or four of us in a room yeah it like there there is something about that, the undivided attention, because sometimes when we've been in a relationship with more than one person, more than one other person, I, the dynamics in that yeah. constellation, so, you know, the bouncing around of attention, the bouncing who's around the of center attention. of attention, who's getting their needs met is that it is harder to meet the intimacy threshold, right? So if intimacy could be described as, vulnerability plus time yeah right something okay. like that Let, just, just to just posit that something out there if it were then well i would need i need to have a pretty immense capacity for paying attention if i'm going to try to have an intimate dinner of eight versus yeah. an intimate dinner of two yep so you you started describing that and I thought, right, so focus, the 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 one on one focus. Well, then I was picturing here's me and two other people, and I want to have a, an intimate dinner. And you were talking about vulnerability. So they each present something to me that they feel vulnerable about. Yeah. In uh, vulnerability plus time. Well, here's the thing vulnerability minus time. So Two people at the same time present to me something vulnerable. Yeah. The one I ignore because I can only talk to one person at a time feels like they, like, oh, here, there's this. No one cares. They're not looking at so me. So exclusion oh, instantly enters yeah, the scenario. Of, because literally I physically can only talk to one person at a time. I can't respond to them both at the same time. Now, now but this is, some... so, the, and I, I think, okay, this happened a lot in our first experience of relating like this. Um, trying to figure out how to, <laughs> to utilize undivided attention and, and the, um, the idea of paying attention, which in different languages is put differently, That's right. holding yeah, attention, earning, earning, earning attention, paying attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. To be able to pay attention to two people or three people or four people is to allow the attention to, to move around the room. Not right. to be presented with two simultaneous vulnerabilities. However, in an ethical non-monogamy relationship, or at least how I've experienced it, it is inevitable that at some point, two competing vulnerabilities or needs will come up yep. at the same time, and another person is going to have to make a decision. They're going to prioritize. And prioritizing can feel incredibly painful and it can build intimacy amongst another people. You know, so yeah. like if you wind up being the person who's prioritized, you can feel a boost in yep. your how you were held, how the attention worked. Um, I mean, I'm now realizing, I mean, this happens amongst our children. That's, yeah, immediately I sure, started thinking we, about Sure, you know, them. we have seven kids. So bouncing the attention around a complicated room is something I have... I have really honed that particular skill, yeah. but 
it was hard at first. It's and not easy. It is hard. And speaking for myself, putting myself into the situations that you're describing, and also thinking about the kids um, and imagining their experiences, but definitely for me. So that the scenario that I that I said, okay, so you put something vulnerable out there and nothing happens right away. Yeah. How that time feels changes with the level of trust you have with the people that you're dealing with. Oh, yeah. Because if, if so there's you, a pause, and do you interpret that pause do you, yeah. as neglect? As neglect, or, or do you see that the situation is in fact complicated and it's um, and there's there's something else going on and that's okay because you know it'll come back around um, and so intimacy for me in um, in romantic relationships in, in particular has been built through um, incremental increases in trust mm -hmm. absolutely but when it comes to friendship Sometimes I, I dive into friendships really like I go whole, like just pff, all the way in. Although, I mean, I tend to do that romantically too. I tend to be a jump head first right into the deep end kind of person. But I was thinking about how the the trust, everybody in the, the particular relationship constellation isn't building trust in the exact same way at the exact same pace. Yep. They don't have the same background. They don't have the same um, attachment uh, patterns. Yep. Um, they don't have the same history of bruises and bumps so it's going to feel different so you can have a great time building intimacy or you know having having opportunities to be vulnerable to be perhaps physically interacting um i hopefully we'll get to physically interact That'd with be anyone. Nice one day. Yeah. um well, you can be having those experiences and still not be gaining trust at the same rate as the other people in the room you might be slower to develop the sense of trust. Yeah, sure. Um, Everybody does that different. Right. It, this is this is a really challenging piece of not following the script that says, okay, you're going to be intimate with one person. But I, I want to circle back around and say, so if we're talking about intimacy, what exactly are we talking about? Because, you know, in the scenario that I laid out at the beginning, so that, that classroom that I was in where that young man was so upset um, he had, he had self-identified as, um, cisgender, heterosexual and had a girlfriend. And so the picture he painted for himself, as he explained it later was I said, intimate dinner. And he's immediately thinking of a rival, um, who is going to interrupt his, his mm -hmm. love bond, right? He was just instantly went there, but I had said intimate dinner and I genuinely, the way I had been imagining it was intimate dinner the way you might have used that phrase a hundred years ago or even 50 years ago just a a close gathering a um a it was i wasn't thinking into the romantic at all and i definitely wasn't thinking about the interruption of that love bond i wasn't that's just not where i was headed i was trying to paint a picture of closeness yeah you you asked me that question and i immediately pictured you sitting at a particular table at our favorite restaurant the one next to the fireplace there, yeah and uh with someone and you asked what that um what my response to that was and my response is well that sounds fun for you like i i don't you have your puppy face on them. i don't have anything beyond that well my puppy face is not there going to be leftovers it's literally a puppy <laughs> face i was literally. thinking i mean we haven't been to that restaurant in a long time because of covid but okay um, okay risotto balls it is ah yes um so also um i uh, <laughs> My particular experience of com compersion is I really like when you get time with other people. I know how important it is to you. I'm how very extra value it. So I do like. And so time the idea with that that and and diversity yeah. diversity is very important to you. You and I can can be be all all intimate all up and all oh. all the time, but you crave variety of experience. I'm. I'm I'm still going to be me. You know, yeah, month I'm, month eleven of the pandemic is uh, over familiarity right. has become the the phrase. 
Yeah, I do. I do crave. I like to have a lot of people in my life. So I, yeah. You... And I like to be able to experience different people. But I also think it brings into question the whole notion of what intimacy is, what relation, what, what does it mean to be in an intimate relationship with someone if you are of a, a particular or, or a sexual orientation or I just get so confused because for years, okay, so I've been out as bi or pansexual, depending on what room I was standing in and what word I chose to use, um, attracted to people, not definitely not attracted to specific genders. Um, my whole, like, for as long as I can remember, I mean, I, the first time I used the word bi, I was very young. Um, so, but I was allowed to be in very, very close and vulnerable friendships with women when I was in a monogamous, heterosexual looking relationship the, the first time. That was, it was never a question of whether I could be in those relationships. I was allowed to have all those friendships and have them be as close as I wanted and vulnerable and like deeply connected to my life, woven into my life. It wasn't until there was a threat from a dude. <laughs> like Which is, it wasn't until I wanted a close, intimate friendship with a guy. That and why that's was a question. threatening for someone who has romantic feelings about anybody, why the why the dude me. thing was threatening is just it a, confused me so much. And uh, it still confuses me. I still I feel myself trying to I'm trying to express how this was and I I feel tangled immediately. So I, that's what tangles me up. So about monogamy. I get confused by the the lines that get drawn. Um so personal I, confusion. So it's personal yeah, so confusion. I I um so I grew up imagining I mean cisgender that yes I am and I grew up with a a heterosexual viewpoint completely um, with a, with a couple of little blips of, well, maybe there's a little bit more to life than that, a little bit more to me. And then, and now it's clear to me that um, I am not heterosexual. I am, I am bi. I, the word pan, the pansexual confuses me a little bit but I think it's because of my black and white thinking more pansexual than bi because bi does assume there's only two. Yeah. Th so and that I, is a, that is I, a conversation for the ages. Yeah. We, we can keep having that conversation. Yeah. Um, some people feel that bi is inclusive and some people feel right. it isn't in so, the case of both but, of us though, we both identify as people who are attracted to all genders Yes, and we both identify as people who are, um, ethically non-monogamous in some sort of endemic way, yep. but we didn't know that going in. No, I didn't know any of This is of stuff that. we've, we discovered and codified and actually said out loud for the first time inside this relationship, which meant there was a lot of negotiation to do around what it meant. How close are you allowed to be? Because when you, you just said you get confused about monogamy and I think we've both experienced this. It's the confusion that comes with it feels like there's a rule book somewhere. And we're going to talk about agreements in the next one, but it feels like there's a rule book somewhere, but that we weren't issued a copy. Right. And so there's this invisible set of rules and that's confusing. So let's, we'll set aside, we'll set that aside. the agreements, yeah, right. but <laughs> that rule book appears to have in it some amount of intimacy that is, yep. that is um, compatible with being called friendship. But there's a point, there's a line after which you have crossed over and now it's too far and now it's gone to the, the phrase. And this came up a lot in our first, at the beginning of our relationship, an intimate friend. What oh, does that mean? Right. Are yeah, you allowed to be an intimate, intimate friend? Does that imply, is that code? So in what we found was that some members of our friend and family circle used the phrase intimate friend as code for they're having an affair. And some people <laughs> used that phrase to mean they're very, very close yeah. and it sort of, it, it, but, but there was an, an expectation that they're very, very close, but they don't break their monogamy agreements. There was this underlying tone. So when I told the world, told people, I loved you, 
um, it wasn't about sex. Was I physically attracted to you? Yes. It was like painfully aware that I was, but it was about this, this intense, um, desire to know you very closely. I wanted to know you. I remember. I wanted to be friends with you. I wanted to hang out with you all the time. I wanted to spend lots of time knowing what the hell made you tick because you were a total mystery, even though I'd known you my whole life. So the sexual attraction, which was there, I felt like I could control that if I needed to. I didn't want to, but I could. But I didn't know how to control this, this, the, uh, the fuse that had been lit to want to, that's the same thing that happens when I fall in friend love. <laughs> I don't know why we default to fall in love being romantic. Yeah, I don't when know. I, see, I have met people who I'm like, oh, I need to be friends with them. And once I do, I want I want to spend lots of time with them and I want to get to know them. And I and it is confusing. You're you are so much more a practical person than I am. I think we're so everything you just described resonates for me. I want to share context with the people. Like what where what does the world look like for you? Yeah. And and you know, what do you And how do? did you get to that? And spot? how did you get there? Know their stories, know what the world looks like and share some of those perspectives and and i immediately hear you describing all of the things you do to get that context whereas yeah. i'm like oh i want to share context period it's true <laughs> what are you gonna do <laughs> oh right <laughs> yeah you well i mean i've also worked for a while so i have i have a very close friend angela who um she and i are building a very intentional friendship and and so we've been stepping through using um, using Shasta, Shasta Nelson's book um, for intimacy and just all of, each of our own therapeutic work using that to help us figure out. So how do we become better friends? How do we keep becoming better friends? So I do have some really clear uh, a roadmap, which is to that, set and that is great. Sorts. And it it actually circles us right back around to uh, intimacy, I think, because. What's better? Better friend? What's better? Well, that's a better How do we know it's gotten better? A, a intimacy. It, I mean, I, for me personally, I'm not certain that intimacy is, is a thing unto itself. It is a feature of relationships that has, that, that can be, it's like a, a color. That's interesting because yeah, there are people who I have felt intensely intimate with in a single night. Right. And there are people, and I knew you for four, for, well, I knew you for 33 years before ever having any sense of knowing who you were. Like actually like that, that thing where the, where the, like the, where the, the wall drops down or whatever. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I knew, oh, oh, I see you a little bit. I can't, <sighs> I don't think, so it's not just time. You can, because you can, you can no, go from zero nope. to a hundred, you know. I have been in situations, um, the time nature studies and men's group retreats and things like that. Oh where yeah. You drop in really you have quick. Like, yeah. You drop in quick. And in the course of an hour, you have this incredibly intimate, which is to say sharing things that I don't share much with. And, and right. then they, that's a back and, and forth. So and then, and then we go home. So I've and also been to sex parties where you do a whole bunch of physical, physically intimate things that I, that no intimacy right. feels for yep. me. I didn't feel any sense of intimacy. Like it was more like playing a game or going to a really interesting Dungeons and Dungeons game, which I've never been to a really interesting one. Well, that was good. One. You said Dungeons yeah. and Dungeons. I like that. Dungeons and Dungeons. It's just yep. all it's Dungeons. It's just all and Dungeons. Then and then it turns left. And then <laughs> Are there any monsters? Nope. Oh my I... God. What are we doing? <laughs> so. A dungeon party. <laughs> ah, dun that's why be, it was dungeons it and was, dungeons. Yeah. So a dungeon party, a party could be very um, physically satisfying and yet not feel intimate for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I've been on a single date where that's it. Like I, you know, forty-five minutes in, and I'm like entranced in a in a in a little bubble of of going deeper and getting to know this person. I do think that time always factors in because oh over the course of time, the potential to know more and more yeah. and to create shared context and to create shared meaning. And the imagination of potential. But if you don't, yeah. I've also known people for a long, long time. And there's an intimacy threshold that doesn't seem to be able to, I mean, yep. 
I can think of at least one person who was in my life. Uh, I think I've known them for six years now, but there's a threshold. I, f I feel like I have tried to cross that threshold consensually. Um, I feel like I've, I've done the things that I know to do about being, um, so Sh Shasta Nelson posits um, positivity, um, investment of time and vulnerability. And I feel like I've done all three of those things and yet I haven't been able to cross that threshold because not because it would be, a, I, I can't get consent. The person right. doesn't, yeah. they, they clearly don't consent to it. They say, they use the words that they're consenting. They want but into they this. And then, um, and then they, they don't pick up their right. side of it. And so our relationship has stalled at, um, at a particular level. I would say it's stalled at like, um, seventh date level mm. for six years. Like just, it's just stalled, stalled there. And I had to sometime in the last couple of years, just come to realize that's it. That's what this person has available and that that's okay. And that that doesn't mean that we're, we have no intimacy, but that I, I couldn't actually get that need met through and, that relationship yeah, and or that you, desire. My experience of you is that you prefer a lot of intimacy in your relationships. And, and I like, like you, an ever increasing. And an ever increasing. I have are, no idea how much I could have. Yeah. <laughs> Very definitely a, a growth mindset. I want the, the Golden Corral buffet of intimacy. Oh, oh my. <laughs> yeah, that sounds not classy. Doesn't sound. That doesn't sound classy. Well, you're not classy. I'm not. I don't even really try. You don't. No, I do. I, I have no idea where this could all go. Like. Right. And so you're, well, you, <laughs> you, you find people fascinating. You like them. I mean, you study psychology continually and have your whole life. You find them you like how amazing. weird we all are. And in my youth, I found I, when I was a kid, I was terrified of people and I converted that into hating people. Yeah. In the uh, the classic trope, really. Um, and over time and thank everything that I met you because you presented really met. me. So you've known me the whole time. No, actually met. met you. We have and, like our known the whole time and then our. Yep. Yeah real meaning because the in sharing intimacy with you in sharing your context i was able to because of the way i do it i will put myself in other people's perspective oh you like this thing let me see if i like it by standing in it and acting like i do <laughs> and it works really well for me because something is like nope <laughs> don't like that um and i can be certain and it turns out i like people and i'm interested in them and it's and I got that out of the intimacy as I experience it with you, which is working on constantly sharing more of the context of your life and seeing what it feels like to be you. So now we're but it's talking not like about it's, empathy a little bit. Yeah. But it's not like it's easy for you. I mean, I see you struggle. It's a stretch. To and, and, and struggle against your own demons, even when people mm -hmm. want to be friends with you. Yeah. I see you get in your own way. And sometimes I'll, have, I'll remind you, like, um, didn't this person... Didn't they sort of offer up friendship? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw them offer up friendship. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw them. Or I've and I've seen people offer you romantic relationship and you just sort of miss it. Just miss but it. it. But it do feels do you though? I right. Know. Yeah. Yeah. But but and your I'm... attachment pattern, as I have witnessed it, is very secure, but your coping strategy, My coping strategy switches over into avoidant, avoidant. Whereas mine switches over into yeah. anxious. That avoidance, I see why. Why that would be the tool you used, I do. Well, I'm sorry that it's. It doesn't lit. work that well for me to as I reach toward my goals, and I through through discussions just this past week, I have recommitted myself to, um, to pursuing. Uh, I think of it as intimacy, pursuing depth. intimacy, depth right? yeah. of relationship with the people that I know that I am interested in, but haven't spent the time on because of my, all my own. It's an investment. Angles. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, intimacy is, in my experience, always an investment. It might be short in time, but it's always going to be an investment in vulnerability and presence. It's an investment in time. And, and so I just want to quick say, um, I talked to Rick and he... He's, you know who Rick is, yes. and Rick knows who Rick is. And I said, oh, I'm struggling with feeling inadequate. And he immediately said, is your inadequacy based on the, the feeling that you don't have enough time? <laughs> and, and, and Thanks, Rick. <laughs> and 
at its surface, no, but eventually it got right to it. It was like bang, it was right there. So that's that's the some of the benefits of intimacy with someone. Very okay. cool. Yeah, they can see you. Ha. Huh. Okay. We're gonna pick this back up and we're gonna talk about agreements next episode. We'll yeah. be right back. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>